Late one night in 1944, in German-occupied Amsterdam, three armed men burst into the apartment of this, uh, an apartment belonging to this woman, Maria de Vries. She lived there with her seven-year-old daughter and a young Jewish woman named Nell, who had been hiding there with her for the previous year. The intruders were Dutch Nazis who had been tipped off by a neighbor, and as they hauled Nell away ultimately to the camps, their leader put a gun to Maria's head and demanded to know the names of her contacts in the Dutch underground. You have 10 seconds, he told her. 10, nine, eight. Now Maria was in fact a member of the Dutch underground and she had no illusions as to this man's intentions. She had seen far too much cruelty for that. Seven, six, five, four. Maria was a woman of great faith, and she prayed, and as she prayed, a great clarity came to her. She began to think lucidly about her situation. She realized that if she told these men what they wanted to know, they had no reason to keep her alive. At least for now, all they had were suspicions. Three, two, one, well. I don't know anything, Maria said. I don't know what you're talking about. I just took pity on a poor girl. For a moment, it seemed certain that the man would pull the trigger. But abruptly, he lowered his gun, spit some invectives, and with his companions, walked out. Those hellish 10 seconds in the life of Maria de Vries were a classic countdown. And what I want to argue to you today is that we, as a society, although we may live in the most countdown-rich era in human history, need to get a lot smarter about countdowns and to do that, to deal with the sort of problems we've been describing today, we need to start learning from people like Maria de Vries. This is your dictionary moment. The word countdown didn't actually appear in the English language until 1952. And then it referred specifically to the backward counting that NASA later made, later made famous. But over time, in popular usage, it came to refer to any marked counting of, of our progress toward a particular moment in time, as in the countdown to war, or the countdown to summer. The first countdown many of us uh, encounter is this one, at the hands of our parents. <laughs> and if you think, by the way, that this is a, that's not fair, it's a count up instead of a countdown, think about it. Three is launch time. This poor kid is totally doomed. And, and, and what we know is that countdowns start happening in our head every time we start marking progress to a particular future time or event. Near as I can tell based on my research, there are three ways we use countdowns and only three ways we use countdowns. We use them to build tension, as the Dutch Nazi did and as mom was doing. We use them to control our anger, you know, take a breath and count to ten or count back from three. And we use them to structure our response to deadlines that are approaching and measure our progress towards them. Now, we tend to think that we're put upon in modern society, and that we're, that we're the only ones who have ever suffered deadline pressure. But think about Noah. Now, Noah was not given a deadline, curiously, to build the ark, but to fill it with all the known species of the earth. He had seven days. And if you don't think he was counting down those days, I don't know what you're thinking. But today we have gotten exquisitely good at this whole process of counting down. We count down everything. We have countdowns to tell us how long it will take us to cross the street. We have countdowns to tell us how long it will be before we get to talk to a live person. We have countdowns to tell us how long till the next presidential election. Some people think this is good, some bad. We have, we have countdowns to tell us how long, how many shopping days left before Christmas. And by the way, this is a real count. And for those of you who are expecting gifts from me, I need you to know this. We, we pretend to be put upon by these deadlines, and we are, we feel the pressure of them, but we also love them. They're an absolute staple of TV and film and books and entertainment of all types, including the most emergent type digital games. Every, almost every digital game has some element of a countdown in it. This is a very, one of the top uh, most popular iPhone apps. Now, now think about that. We actually load countdowns onto devices that we, we carry with us and willingly submit ourselves to. So we arrive at this moment in human history where we are pay playing an ever-increasing game of beat the clock, perpetually counting down the time on everything between where we are now and what we might want or need or fear or must do in the future. And that makes a whole lot of sense when you're living in a complicated society because what science has shown us is that we're really bad at three things when it comes to complexity. Our minds can't fix 
um, complex tasks and time. Our minds are also really lousy at dealing with an overabundance of choice. We're actually unhappy and become paralyzed in that situation. And we're really bad at breaking difficult tasks into manageable chunks. Countdowns help us do all of those things, overcoming those natural deficits. But here, <laughs> here's a question I have for you, because there's a problem here. If that's why we're seeing such an explosion of countdowns, why are we so lousy at the ones that really matter in terms of dealing with complexity? Be it what seemed like a pretty simple one on the debt crisis, or dealing with some of the more complex tasks that we've been hearing about today, like climate change, like endemic poverty, like world hunger, like dealing with our dependence on foreign oil. Why are we so bad at even setting countdowns on those things? And I think one of the reasons is that we are training ourselves to view countdowns as this. We are training ourselves to believe that if we miss one, there'll always be another one, and besides, we can go out and celebrate. By the way, I endorse this countdown. I think it's a great one, and we'll do it later. But I, I believe that if we're going to get serious about dealing with the issues we've been talking about in this room, we need to adopt a philosophy of countdowns that takes us back more to this model, the model of Maria de Vries, or this is the late Carnegie Mellon professor Randy Pausch. Many of you in this room even worked with him. Many of us knew him. Uh, and what was extraordinary about this man is he was given one of the worst countdowns imaginable. And what he did with it transformed his ordeal into an international lesson um, that we all can admire. Maria and Randy faced decidedly different countdowns, but here's what they had in common. They had five elements in common, and based on what I've been able to determine, these are the five elements of all truly consequential countdowns in our lives. First of all, they're imposed on us. We don't choose them. We don't load them on our phone. They're being imposed on us by, by someone or something that is counting down time for us. The stakes in them are extraordinarily high. They're life or death or feel like it. They seem to offer us only really bad choices, choices between bad and bad. There's some level of uncertainty about them. Some level of agency on our part will affect them, even if just at the margins. And finally, fifth, there is a finality to them. No matter what happens at the end of the countdown, the world is never going to be the same when we get to the end of that countdown. And having studied a lot of people like Randy and Maria, what I can tell you is that they respond in five brilliant ways. And these five brilliant ways are ones that we should all consider because consequential countdowns are a part of all of our lives, even when we're not paying attention to them. You all have them or you know people who do, people who are counting down the time to an end of a life, an end of a marriage, an end of a relationship, an end of a job, an end of something dear to them. And the first response that's, that, that you see in people like Randy and Maria is fierce acceptance. Now this is different from just passively accepting what's happening to you. This is acknowledging that there is no reset button and that the only thing you should focus on in this moment is the countdown that is determining everything about your life in that time. And what that allows them to do through that process of fierce acceptance is exercise fierce defiance. Sure, the choices in these consequential countdowns are lousy, but what then they step up to deliver is an idea that maybe they don't have to accept the deal as offered. Maybe they can come up with their own choices in the process. What's remarkable, too, is that they, they exercise in that moment an, am an amazing ability to think clearly. They tap into not panic, not emotion, not checking out, but reason. They think through what is happening to them. And at the same time, as they're thinking it through, they're tapping into a deeper sense of purpose. It may be religious faith. It may be a sense of legacy for the world. It may be just a commitment to country or nation or global population, but there is a deeper sense of purpose that you see emerge in these people. And finally, through that process of putting those pieces together, they demonstrate a capacity to transform the countdowns so that they end up being about something completely different than they started in. They started being a choice between death and betrayal and they end up being a, a, a profile in courage. They start being about how to die. They end up being about how to live. It is an extraordinary lesson. What if in the discussions we had about problems like we were talking about today, things like climate change, we were actually setting, t treating these countdowns as consequential? What if we started acknowledging that the countdowns are happening every day in our lives and being measured in roads not taken, 
dreams lost or not realized, time not spent with loved ones, or at a societal level, countdowns being measured in the melting of glaciers, lives of soldiers being lost needlessly, uh, minds being wasted in schools that don't function. What if we started acknowledging that those countdowns are real and started making choices on a fierce commitment to making better ones at the end of those countdowns? One of my favorite quotes from Randy Pausch came not from his last lecture, the famous one, but from his last, last lecture, one on time management that he gave. And he quoted Disney employees and he said, you know, what they always say when asked when the park will close, the park is open until eight. And I love that because what people like Randy Pausch and Maria de Vries do in facing consequential countdowns is they transform the closed into the open. They, they transform the negative into the positive. They transform the end into a new beginning. This is a picture of me standing in front of Maria de Vries' apartment. Uh, I made a pilgrimage there with my son a few years ago because you see Maria is, was my grandmother. And, and yeah. um, her little girl grew up to become my mom. And the young uh, woman, Nell, actually survived the war and came back years later to thank my grandmother for what she'd done. And what, what my grandmother taught me, or teaches me now across the void of time, is that acknowledging consequential countdowns is important. There are countdowns that are consequential, but it is how we react to them that makes them truly consequential. I love this quote from Mary Oliver, and I wonder how we might react if we realized, um, if, we, if, we, if we rephrased this wonderful quote, uh, poem of hers, tell me what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life, and added, tell me what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious world. Because in the end, there is only one countdown that truly matters and that is shaped by the answer to the question that my grandmother's example poses. And that is that the truly important countdown is the one that runs from one to done. Thank you.